Greetings, folks. Professor Fiore back to continue our discussion on waves in human hearing. Good stuff. Hope you enjoyed the last video. Quick review. We said that we could talk about these sound waves in terms of a fundamental building block, the sine wave. All waves are going to be built up on our sine wave. So this is the time axis. This is an amplitude axis in the case of something we can hear. That is going to be an acoustic pressure. If we're talking about a signal in a, uh, you know, like a music player, headphones, something like that, then it's a voltage or a current. But either way, we have something like this, right? It's a nice symmetrical sort of wave that just keeps on repeating over and over and over and over again. We care about the amplitude. That's going to correlate, as we shall see, with loudness. And we care about the time it takes for this thing to repeat itself. We call that the period, T. And since the things that we can hear as humans um, repeat very rapidly compared to a second, we typically use frequency instead, and frequency F is basically the reciprocal of period. It's 1 over t. And that has units of hertz, named after Heinrich Hertz, abbreviated HZ. So a typical healthy um, human can hear, young human can hear maybe from, on the low end, 20 hertz, super low bass, up to 20 kilohertz, very, very top end. Highest, highest treble, high frequencies. The amplitude range is very, very large. Um, if you think of zero dB SPL, sound pressure level SPL, that's the quietest thing you can hear. And then you talk about something that's really, really loud, where we're talking about the threshold of feeling, the threshold, we're starting to get into the, the range of threshold of pain, that might be up around 120 or so dB SPL. Okay. Now, in, in pressure, 20 decibels, this is a logarithmic scheme, decibels, 20 decibels is a factor of 10. So you're looking at six factors of 10, a million to one. That's huge, right? The, the basic threshold that we're talking about is about 20 micropascals. If you were listening to something that was up around a pascal in terms of amplitude, you'd be well into the 90s, 90 dB SPL. You know, very, very loud. Um, and then if we got up to maybe like, you know, 10 pascals, you'd be putting your fingers in your ears because it's going to be just really loud. All right, let's try to get an idea of what um, these are. It's one thing for us to say, oh, you can hear 50 hertz or you can hear 5 kilohertz. But what's it actually sound like? So I've got my little computer program, my sample wrench uh, set up off screen here, and I just have a couple of different sine waves plugged in, and I'm going to play them. Right, so the first one is 100 hertz tone, kind of a low frequency. It's like the lower end of you know, like a human male voice. Then we're going to hear a 500 hertz tone, which is you know a bit higher, probably higher than I could hope to sing. And don't worry, I won't even try. And then we hear something in, in the higher range, like five kilohertz. That's where we get a lot of articulation in terms of uh, instruments and voice and things like that. So one moment. First, we're going to hear. 100 hertz. Now, depending on what you're using for playback here, that might not have come out too loud, but you can probably tell it's still a pretty low pitch. Now we move along to 5 kilohertz. Excuse me, 500 hertz. So that you should be able to hear with no problem, right? That's, that's getting up there. We still consider that sort of a mid-range tone. And finally, we're going to go to 5 kilohertz, which is pretty high. Right? Getting up there, that's clearly not the highest thing. Um, young, healthy humans can hear about two octaves higher than that, up to about 20 kilohertz. So remember, an octave... That's a borrowed musical term. 
is a factor of two. So if I go from 500 hertz to a kilohertz, it's a factor of two. I don't care that it's 500 hertz more. I care it's a factor of two. That's an octave. If I go from 5 kilohertz to 10 kilohertz, also a factor of two. Right? So if you think about that for a sec, the hertz business doesn't really matter. It's not, I shouldn't say it doesn't matter, but it's, it can be very misleading. A, a one or two hertz shift in frequency, for most people, if it's at the high end, if we're talking like, you know, 15 kilohertz or something like that, you can't hear it in isolation. In other words, if I played you a 15 kilohertz tone, and then I played you a 15,002, right, 15,002 hertz tone, you probably wouldn't be able to hear, tell that there were different tones. But at low frequencies, you can. It's actually pretty easy. If I played you a 40 hertz tone and then a 42 hertz tone, it would be an obvious change. Because obviously 2 hertz out of 40 is a much bigger change than 2 hertz out of 15,000. And that's what our ears are sensitive to, are those ratios. We're sensitive to ratios in amplitude and we're sensitive to ratios in frequency. Okay? Consequently, when we draw graphs of frequencies, which we'll do down the road, uh, typically those are done in a logarithmic scale. It's not a linear scale, you know, where every block is the same unit. Um, what we'll see in a semi-log frequency scale is every block, so to speak, every unit, centimeter, inch, whatever it is, represents the same ratio. In other words, it might represent an octave or maybe a decade, remember a decade's a factor of 10, rather than, you know, so many hertz, 5 hertz, 10 hertz, 1,000 hertz. Okay? So that's where we're starting. All right, so those were pure tones. Now, if you listen to a voice, if you listen to a musical instrument, they sound different. In other words, I can have a person singing you know, a, um, a middle C, and I can have a musical instrument play the middle, um, the middle C, the same exact note, and you know that they're different. You know that one is, you know, an, an instrument and one is a voice. Or if two people sing the same note, you know that they're two different people. Two instruments do the same note, you know that they're, again, two different instruments. How does that work? Well, that's essentially taking sine waves and adding more pieces to it. So, as I said, the sine wave is the simple building block, and everything goes up from there. I start adding sine waves together, and I start getting new waveforms. If I just took a snippet, right, I recorded, let's say, a person just singing, ah, and I looked at that waveform, it wouldn't look like a sine wave. Or if I took, uh, you know, a saxophone, and I just had him play one note, I, you know, looked at it, and by the way, you can do this on my free audio software, Sample Wrench, right? You can record things, lo load them in there, and actually see this, okay? You might see, instead of a nice sine wave, you will see something that's probably going to repeat, but in an odd kind of way. You know, maybe it's going to look something like that, right? So there's one cycle of it. But it's got all these other little humps and jiggles and, and things like that going on, okay? Now, it might be hard to imagine, but this wave that repeats can actually be broken down into a whole bunch of sine waves. All of those pieces are called partials. Then we have to break that down. That's everybody. Typically, the lowest frequency in this group of partials is called the fundamental. And everybody else is referred to as, a, as an overtone, right? It's an, a, a frequency that's above the fundamental. So it's fundamentals plus overtones. Now, if the overtones are in a very strict order, if they're all nice integer multiples of the fundamental, so let's say the fundamental is 100 hertz, and all my overtones are at integer multiples, so they're at like 200 hertz, 300 hertz, 400 hertz, 500 hertz, you might skip some of those,
but they would all be multiples of 100, right? You wouldn't have like 100, 117, 212. It would all be, it could be like 100, 300, 400, 500, 700, 800, right? They're all multiples of 100. We have a special name for that. The overtones would be referred to as harmonics. So if you're a musician, you've heard that term, right? A harmonic is an integer overtone. So I combine these things up and I can come up with a wave, right? Here's a real quick example. I'm going to take a wave that looks pretty much nothing like, pretty much nothing like a sine wave. Um, if you play a synthesizer, you would be familiar with this, an analog synthesizer, certainly, and that would be a square wave. So a square wave just looks like this. It comes up, it's nice and flat, comes down, right? So, you know, very square looking. You can build a square wave out of a bunch of sine waves, and this seems counterintuitive because, you know, these are like straight lines with hard corners, and a sine wave is such a nice smooth waveform. How do you do it? How do you get from square one to square two, so to speak? Well, what we do is we start with a sine wave that's the same as this base frequency. That would be the fundamental, right? So if that square wave was, was at 100 hertz, we would start with a 100 hertz, right? Here, I'm going to use those same cross points, a 100 hertz sine wave. And then I'm going to add a sequence of harmonics. So the first harmonic I'm going to add is going to be at three times this. So if this was 100 hertz, I'm going to add 300 hertz, and I'm going to do it at one-third of the amplitude. All right, so whatever this is, I'm going to take one-third of that. Looks something like that, right? So there's one cycle, two cycle, three cycle. We'll just say the amplitude's about one-third. I realize it's not a great drawing. Bear with me. Now, I'm going to graphically add these two things together and get a new waveform. So in this area right here, this positive hump adds, so I get something above. In the middle, this subtracts away, and then this thing adds. And the inverse happens over here, right? So this adds, makes it bigger, and then here it subtracts away. So what you get is a waveform that would kind of look like that. All right. We don't really have a name for that waveform. I always refer to it as a molar waveform because it kind of reminds me of a molar, right? Okay. Now, if I keep doing this, if I go and say, okay, I'm going to get five times the frequency at 150 amplitude, seven times the frequency at 17th the amplitude, nine times the frequency at 19th the amplitude, you keep adding these together. I'm not going to draw them all, but what, what you'll find is that you know, this blue waveform compared to the black, compared to the original sine wave, is let's say it's a little closer to a square than the sine wave is. You know, the sides are a little steeper and the top is a little flatter. It's got a double hump in it. But when you start adding these other harmonics, this thing just keeps getting steeper and steeper and steeper, and these ripples keep getting smaller, and there's more of them. And if you add an infinite number of these things, you will wind up with that square wave. And you can do that with any wave. Right? You can rip the thing apart, okay? Mathematically. That's what separates, you know, someone's voice from a different person's voice. That's what separates the sound of, you know, a trombone and a, and a trumpet playing the same note. You can tell that they're different instruments or, you know, a clarinet or whatever the heck it is, okay? So I'm going to illustrate that really, really quick with the help of a bass guitar. Okay, so I have my trusty little bass guitar here. Now bass, if you're not familiar, is tuned one octave. Remember an octave is a factor of two. It's one octave lower than a standard tuned guitar. So the lowest note on a guitar, it's E, A, D, G. Um, so the same as the four bottom notes, uh, four bottom strings, excuse me, on a guitar. Um, so this right here, this is an E, this would be the lowest note on a normal guitar. Now with standard tuning, that's roughly 82 hertz. So the open E string is 12 frets, 
right? For the 12 notes that you go up in the octave, okay? The, and of course you skip, right, to get, a, to get a scale, to get a major scale, minor scale, whatever. Um, so if you open this, this is an octave down, so it's about 41 hertz. A lot of what you're hearing there, in fact, are overtones. If it was a pure 41 hertz tone, it really wouldn't sound like that. Right, but that's the same note an octave apart. Now, this note, unlike some instruments, you can play the same note in different places on a, on a bass or on a guitar. Now, piano, if you want to play a middle C, there's only one place to play it. You got one key that's a middle C and that's it. But on an instrument like this, there's multiple places you can play the same note. So here's that E, which can also be found here, which can also be found here. Now, if you listen carefully, those don't sound exactly the same. And of course, if I strike it differently, right, if I pop this thing or slap it, Sorry. Doesn't sound the same. If I use the pick. So what's different there? It's this stuff. It's the harmonics. It's the overtones. And those things vary in time, too. Right? It's not just the set of extra frequencies that you have. It's also how they evolve over time that matters. So, you know, when you... When you uh, slap or pop a string that has a much stronger percussive attack. There's a, a lot of high frequency energy in the very beginning of that versus that's a more rounded, smellow kind of sound, right? When you just hit it like that. Okay, so enough with that guy. Now, Continuing. Oh, don't fall over. Okay. So continuing. You can hear that range of frequencies when you're young and healthy. What happens as you get older? Typically, the high frequencies start to fade away. That doesn't mean you're deaf. It just means you're getting older. It's a natural part of being a human being. Now, you might have seen somewhere along the line a graph, a little frequency graph here, for some uh, audio equipment, you know, an amplifier or something like that, loudspeaker. And they would give you an amplitude on this scale, which typically would be in decibels. And on this scale, we have a frequency. And this would be a uh, semi log scale. So, you know, we talk in terms of those decades. Right? There actually is no origin. There's no zero on a, on a logarithmic scale. So this would be like, you know, one unit, and that would be 10 units. That would be 100 units. See, it's all, all, all going up by a factor of 10. Right? And that would be 1,000 units, 10,000 units, 100,000 units, and so on and so on. Right? All right. So you might see a frequency response plot, maybe for an amplifier, and it would show up maybe something like this. Okay, it's nice and flat. Well, what's going to happen over time is your ears are not going to be as sensitive to some frequencies. It would be analogous to you going up to the stereo and, say, turning down the treble. So instead of going up to 20 kilohertz, right, which on the scale would be around here somewhere, all right, so although you should be doing that when you're young and healthy, right, and on the bottom you'd go down to about 20 so that would be around like here. Okay. Um, what will end up happening is your your uh, acuity to those high frequencies will start to fall off, and you'll start doing this. You won't. It won't sound any different to you. I mean, when I was in college, I was tested to hear on an upper limit of about 21, 21 and a half kilohertz. So I was a little bit better than average. Today, I don't think I could hear. 16 or 17 kilohertz, but nothing sounds different to me. Now, when you get 
drastic hearing loss, all kinds of things can happen. You know, not only does the high frequency drop off, but you know, the overall sensitivity can drop and you can get all kinds of weird dips and, and stuff like that. So when we make modern hearing aids, they are sort of tuned, pardon the pun, to that person's ear in the same way that you have a prescription for glasses, right? They're unique to you. In the old days, the, the uh, simple um, hearing aids was just a simple amplifier. And that was actually one of the first applications for transistors is you would have this little little box, maybe about this big, you'd stick it in your shirt pocket, and there'd be a little wire that would come up to a little earpiece, and all it was is a microphone and a little amplifier just to make things louder. So it makes everything louder. But, you know, if this is the, the shape of your hearing response, just making it louder makes it, goes like, makes it go like this. And it's not this nice flat response that you would like. Okay? Well, one thing you can do to help stave that off is to make sure you always protect your ears. And there's lots of ways you can do that. You want to avoid loud sounds to begin with, but sometimes it's unavoidable. You know, around here, you get a lot of snow in the winter. Got to get out a snowblower, okay? So they're going to have to get some hearing protection on. Well, what do you mean? What's hearing protection? Well, well hang on just a sec. Okay, so, you know, in the simplest case, you can just get some foam plugs. Stick them in the ears, right? That might give you a 20, 25 dB reduction in sound pressure. That's good. It's a lot louder. Get yourself some earmuffs. These are really good. You can get, you know, 30 dB of, of reduction on the uh, surrounding sounds. <sighs> Save your ears. You only get one pair, right? So don't, don't take them for granted. Once they go, that's it. You're stuck. You might get tinnitus. Just the sound of oh, in your ear constantly, right? Oh, geez. Please, no. Can't deal with that. All right. So now we have an idea in terms of the frequency range that people can hear. Something about the amplitudes that we can hear. Um, what about other animals? Okay. Dog whistle. People talk about a dog whistle. I got this whistle for my dog. What is it about a dog whistle that makes it unique? A lot of people think it's dogs have really sensitive hearing and they can hear this really, really quiet whistle that you can't hear. It has nothing to do with the volume. It has all to do with the frequency. Dogs can hear higher pitches than humans can hear. So whereas a human can hear from, you know, healthy humans, 20 to 20 kilohertz, young people. Dogs? They got us about an octave on the top end. They go up to maybe 40 kilohertz. You know, and as always, you know, there's variation here, right? But we have an advantage on the bottom end by about an octave. So you can hear tones lower than dogs can hear. But dogs can hear tones higher than you can hear. So a dog whistle, when you blow into the dog whistle, that might produce a 25 kilohertz tone. I'm just throwing a number out. 25 kilohertz tone. You can't hear it. It's, it's too high of a pitch for you to hear. But your dog can hear it. For your dog, you know, by comparison, it would be like you hearing, you know, a 10 or 12 kilohertz tone. Well, that's something you can hear. And of course, you can be trained. Your dog can be trained. When they hear that tone, hey, come running, okay? Um, other animals have other ranges. If you go the other way, an elephant, they have a really good bottom end, about five hertz. I'm just using some round numbers here, okay? This was discovered accidentally. Um, some researchers out in Africa noted that elephants seem to be communicating over great distances, not being in visual contact. How were they doing it? Somebody had a microphone open. They were recording some things. They didn't have the standard filters on for human voice. And they noticed that there was these really low frequencies, what we would call infrasonics, frequencies that are below the range that we can hear. And they realized that the elephants were communicating with these super low frequencies. On the other hand, you got them on, the, on a high end because they can only hear up to about five kilohertz. 
So you can hear high frequencies that they can't hear. So some funny things to think about, right? Never ask your dog how good your subwoofer is because, you know, they can only hear down to 40 hertz. Lousy judge. On the other hand, you want to know how good those new tweeters are and your loudspeakers, well, they might be a good judge of that, okay? You want the subwoofers checked out, go talk to the elephants. You know, if they could talk to you, they'd say, yeah, you know, it only goes down to 10 hertz. Eh, right? You know, for us, you get down 10 hertz, you feel that. You don't hear that. That's a feeling. You would feel the rumble. You wouldn't hear it so much. Okay? So, you know, you watch a, a, a TV show or a movie, you know, like Star Trek, and there's all these aliens floating around, you know? And interestingly, they almost always look like humans, but with just little different colors and bumps and things on them, right? Interesting, they always have two eyes, a nose, a mouth, in that order, and two ears, right? They might have big ears like Ferengis, but, you know, it's basically the same body plan, okay? Two arms, two legs. Um, here's something that they never really talk about. What's their hearing range? Okay? You know, sometimes you'll see something like, oh, the Ferengi can hear really good. They got these monstrous ears. Um, but there's nothing that says that if we go out into space sometime and we come up, you know, meeting an extraterrestrial, that they're going to hear the same range of frequencies that we hear. They might hear a lot higher, a lot lower, who knows? Okay, they might have a much narrower range. Maybe they can only hear from, from 100 hertz to, you know, 2 kilohertz. Or maybe it's much wider. Who knows? Okay? Um, here's another thought. What if it turned out that the elephants, right, through evolutionary processes, the, the elephants were the really smart ones. And we were just, you know, comparatively to them, not quite so smart. And the elephants kept us as pets. Right? What would end up happening? Maybe the elephants would have little human whistles. And the human whistles would be set up at like 6 or 7 kilohertz. And the Elephants would blow the little human whistle, and they couldn't hear anything, but you and I would be sitting around, and we'd hear that six kilohertz tone, and we'd go, ooh, kibble, dinner's ready, right? And we'd go running over to the elephants. Who knows? Okay? All right, so there is a bit of a change here. Don't assume all creatures are the same in terms of their acuity, right? Their hearing acuity, and we're not, we're not the same from human to human to human, okay? Save your ears. Only pair you get. You're not gonna, you can't trade them in, right? All right, that covers our basics on human hearing. So we can see what the frequency range is, amplitude range is. Um, we have some idea of how this is gonna come together. And as I said in the other video, frequency and pitch are correlated, but they're not identical. Amplitude and loudness are correlated, but they're not identical. The shift as far as frequency is really quite subtle. It's not a huge change. Loudness, on the other hand, can be tremendous. The changes that we see. The human ear is far from equal in terms of its sensitivity at different frequencies. And we need to sort of figure out what the whole deal behind that thing is. It turns out that you can have sound pressure levels at certain frequencies that are higher then they are at other frequencies, but those other frequencies will actually sound louder to you. The way to think about this is that loudness is the human perception of that pressure amplitude. 